into computer security and so computer security into science is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, as hackers, we do real research. We develop proof of concept and what we don't do is write them up well so that academics will pay attention to them. Um, is a hacker. He's also a scientist and he's also an academic. He's Arian is um, a professor at West Point and also a hacker and also a major of the Army. And we are thrilled to have him talk about this today. Please give him your attention. Uh, good afternoon, and I'm glad to be here at ShmooCon today. So, uh, I'm a military officer, and for about the last, I have worked in academia. And during this time, there has been more investment by the DOD and other funding agencies for cybersecurity related projects in academia than any other time. And this is due to many things. Uh, you land more focus on cybersecurity within DOJ and DHS. And as a result, we have more people in academia working on cybersecurity related problems. Unfortunately, there is still a little bit of disconnect between the academic side of the house and cybersecurity in our community. This talk is intended to help initiate a dialogue between the two sides. And I'm going to do this by a bit about this new science of cyber, yet another buzzword. And also I will highlight some of our research at West Point that's, uh, most of which is done in collaboration with other institutions to give you some ideas aside. And, you know, um, I'm open to questions and discussions and even a few. Sh so, first, a little bit about me. This is uh, where I got started thinking about computer science in Iraq. Now, we're in the middle of this counterinsurgency fight, and it's very thing that we had prepared for in the past. We have an enemy that wears no uniform. We have multiple insurgent groups. We have guys who are supposedly good and then change sides two years later. And so all I could think of is, yeah, this stuff is tough. All right? But in all seriousness, the murkiness of the problem, you have to make life and death decisions. Because it's murky, it's difficult to make the right decision. So fast forwarding a bit, when I got to grad school, I studied artificial intelligence. And I started working with my advisor on ways we could apply artificial intelligence. With game theory, I think of what the adversary is going to do next. And I not only think of that, I think of how he's going to respond to what I'm going to do next. And this is an iterative process. Hence, we have our little uh, recursive uh, smiley face. Another way to approach these problems is through logical reasoning. If we can express our environment in a logical language, we can use algorithms to help us make better decisions and inferences about what is going on. For example, we're looking at a logical expression of vehicle surveillance being done against uh, some US forces. And finally, another thing uh, that we looked a lot when I was at grad school was graphical models and the uh, network. Studying the linkages between terrorists help us better understand their organizations and how to defeat them. So we did a bunch of work on this. Some of it continued when I was at West Point. Successful pieces of software. This is just a sampling. So then uh, when I was at Maryland as kind of a hobby, I got interested in cybersecurity along with, uh, and then along with my wife. My good friend uh, Andrew Roof from Trail of Bits, we wrote this book called Introduction to Cyber Warfare. And while I was uh, working on writing this book, became exposed to a lot of facets of uh, problems heard in various incidents that have been called cyber warfare over the last decade. And all I could think about was, you know, this is pretty tough stuff too. So what I've come to the conclusion of is maybe we can apply some artificial intelligence ideas to these problems as well. So game theory. We're going to talk today about using game theory to schedule updates to computer systems that control the power grid. Logical reasoning. Can we 
take our evidence, any evidence we gather in the aftermath of an incident, and use logical reasoning to help us with the attribution problem. And I think Sean's talk was an appropriate precursor to this because he talked about um, you know, standardizing how we're going to represent information about cybersecurity incidents. Uh, output from something like put for s systems where we can reason about things like the attribution problem. And finally, I will talk a little bit about some ongoing work with graphical models where we look at how an attack, we attempt to model how an attacker works his way through a computer network. So science of cyber, a little bit about this buzzword. Um, applying artificial intelligence to the problem is just one aspect of the science of cyber. And the idea uh, behind all of this is we want to be able to leverage uh, some rigorous problem-solving methods from academia for cybersecurity problems. However, it's not only about using existing theories and, and models in academia to address these problems. It's all cybersecurity problems in depth because many of these problems have little nuances that haven't been studied before in the bulk of the academic literature. So addressing these problems not only helps us understand cyber better, but it allows us to do research in the scientific sense that broadens our So why do scientists need practitioners? Why, why do guys like me need most of you in the audience? Well, first off, a scientific paper uh, is dependent on some theory. And every theory is based on certain assumptions. If we don't start our scientific work with good, solid theories, with realistic assumptions, the work we're going to do will generally not be worth very much. Practitioners to help us keep our assumptions better. Data sets. Every theory needs to be tested. One of the best ways to test theories is use some sort of data set. And a great place to get data set is from real world practitioners. And the third thing is transition. If we have a good scientific idea, we come up with a good theory and a good model, eventually at some point we're going to make a piece of software. And the software at first won't be too great, but as soon as we get it into the hands of someone who can actually use it, the sooner the bugs will be found, the sooner the best practices will be determined, the quicker it will be used to help make our systems more secure. So let's go the other way. Why do I think practitioners need scientists? Well, especially at the graduate level, have been trained in very specific subfields. They become experts on very specific things. Sometimes there will only be a handful of people in the world who are knowledgeable about such a specific topic. To new and different methods to address problems that other people have not thought of. Different perspectives. If you're, if you're not focused on the day-to-day -day operations and you're able to take a step back, you can think of, sometimes that's what it takes to think of more novel solutions. An example, when I was in Iraq, day-to-day -day, uh, intelligence analysis, I would be laser focused on what information is important to make sure that the guys on my team survive the next 24 to 48 hours. That was my number one priority, okay? Any person doing any type of operations is going to be focused mostly on the near term. In academia, they have the luxury of being able to focus on more of the bigger picture. And I think this is a complementary uh, viewpoint to the world, and I think it's helpful. And finally, provide a theoretical basis. Uh, scientists are typically very good at identifying subcases as being just one instance of a broader case. And if you have a good theory that generalizes well, that will lead to software products that are useful in more cases, be less brittle, and will be usable more in the long term. So I'm going to start by projects that uh, we just completed a paper on. The full technical paper will be presented later this year in May. However, this is going to give you a, a good overview. Uh, this is done with uh, my colleague Han Shin Lei at West Point. As Roy Lindelof at the Netherlands uh, Defense Academy. So attacking the power grid, um, you know, and in general, um, there have been kind of two attitudes about this. There's one in the United States is so complicated, 
so heterogeneous that there's no way for anyone to learn enough information about it to cause a massive disruption, even cyber attack. The second way of looking at it, systems that govern how the power grid works are proprietary or outdated and are generally not updated and patched as often as they should be because they're doing mission critical work. This being that these systems are open more easily to cyber attacks. So I tend to agree more with the latter camp because I think that you need to be scanning every system that has something to do with the power grid to launch a successful attack to initiate a cascading power failure. So for example, let's take this uh, dummy graph of a power grid network. Let's say the G's, T's are transmission substation and uh, the D's are nodes where the power is delivered to. And let's say we lose a transmission node. If that goes out, his load is going to be redistributed among stations and perhaps it will cause a few lines to overload, which will in turn lead to more transmission stations coming offline. And finally, everyone in this simple example be goes without power. So we created a model that consists of an attacker and a defender, and the attacker can attack a limited number of substations in order to cause a cascade well, the defender, we're saying, is only going to be able to harden a limited number of systems. And we limit the number the defender protect because uh, he is faced with real-world uh, constraints. Often he could take the systems offline. So, yeah, and these pretty much go over what I just said. So stopping cascades, so one way to look at this is let's say we know that the, the attacker attacks stations 5, 6, and 7, he will cause a major cascade. So then maybe the defender will do However, if the attacker knows this, he'll maybe pick substations 3, 9, and 12 to attack. Because if he discounts the fact that he can't get to the other ones, those will cause the maximum outage. On and on. And so our idea is, why don't instead we create a schedule? a probabilistic schedule based on a probability distribution over what we can do is the effectiveness of the attacker. We can't defeat him all the time, but the idea is if we're defeating him most of the time, it's going to reduce the effect of his attacks. So we created a mathematical model uh, to represent the cascading failure. Uh, that's what uh, these two lines of math are this mathematically in a two-player game where the payoff for the attacker is the number of customers that are disconnected from the power grid. The payoff for the defender is just the negative of that. And then we created this algorithm to, uh, uh, to model the gameplay and uh, create a probability distribution over sets of power stations that the defender should defend. So one thing that is was discussed in the previous literature that if the attacker hits a station where a lot of electricity passes through, he can cause a large power failure. So the previous idea was is maybe we should concentrate most of our defense on these certain stations. However, what we found, and this is a graph showing the attacker's benefit, the number, the x-axis is number of disconnected uh, nodes from the power grid, is load that passes through the node the attacker is hitting. So if you look at the box, these are nodes that low electricity, less electricity passes through these stations. However, they still hit these and cause a, a rather massive failure, we have found in our simulations. Well, uh, we have found our algorithm has outperformed this more load-based defense. The game theoretic algorithm is the, uh, is the line with the circles and the load is the line with the X's. And the reason for this is we account for, uh, by having a probabilistic schedule, we account for when the attacker changes his mode of attack in response to what we're doing. We've developed a mathematical model and an algorithm to determine the best defense, and we perform some initial experiments. What we do next is we're going to look at some more experiments we're going to look at how to employ these in a real-world setting. 
And, in, uh, and we're also going to look at other enhancements for real world data if we have more information on the power grid. So we have to figure out is we availability and looking to uh, maybe leverage the topology of the power grid. But the most important thing on this slide is the third one. And this is my question to all of you, is these game theoretic models, this is not the first one that has come up that has been an attempt to apply to a practical situation. There have been many others. If you see this, and this uh, makes you think, hey, be a good idea for problem X in my domain, please, by all means, let me know. We'd be interested. So next I'm going to talk about uh, another project, Intelligent Cyber Attribution, and this is involving uh, some very smart people from some students at West Point and a few other universities. And so, if we want to make an attribution decision, let's say we have some evidence from some different sources, let's say we have some PCAP files, some uh, malware analysis, uh, maybe we even have some traditional intelligence sources there too, like human intelligence. We put them all into some machine and we just reason about it and we come out with an attribution decision. And this seems like a good idea. However, there's some problems with that. Attribution, of course, is difficult because the adversary, everything in a cyber attack, as you all probably know, could be there because the adversary wanted you to see it. Further, it be contradictory. So we have to deal with this somehow. Choose and our goal is to come up with a very rigorous way of addressing them. So here's our idea. Let's say you hire a bunch of security professionals, the evidence and come up with their own conclusions, and then send them to a room and have them argue it out. Okay? Now, this is kind of tongue in cheek, but this is what we want to do in software. We want to have this debate happen in the software system based on the evidence that comes in. And this way we can still account for contradictory information or information that may be the result of deception because we have the system argue it out for us. So here are the characteristics. Um, basically, we're introducing a new mathematical model. We're separating analytic conclusions from the actual evidence what is observed. And we want the system to be transparent. So when it reaches an attribution decision and the analyst reading it, oh, well, that's just bogus, he can see the line of reasoning the system took to get to that point. And then maybe he thinks the system is right, or maybe he thinks, hey, the inputs were all wrong and causing it to get erroneous results. So, example. So here is an example. We have two groups that potentially conducted a cyber attack. We have Dorado. And Group K is an English-speaking group from the fictitious country of Krasnovia. So this is our environmental model, uh, our logical expressions that ex uh, for modeling the evidence and our history. And we could divide this into two parts, aspects about the current situation and historical context. So for aspects about the current situation, we have logical statements, or for actually both parts, we have logical statements. And they are silly, so you could express a degree of confidence. In our, historical in our historical data, we express these as logical rules that occur, that are true with a certain probability. So our next component is an analytical model, and these are statements that someone would say. So for example, evidence would be that we observed, uh, a, you know, we discovered a keylogger on this system. It might be something like, well, we think that uh, because we observed the keylogger, we think they were attempting to uh, uh, do, try to get information about this certain project people are working on. So we want to separate the two in the system. And with each of the, uh, in, with each of the argument components in the analytical side, we have environmental conditions where these are valid. So in, in this case, we have evidence of group K. And we're saying that we're going to say that there's evidence of group K if in the environmental conditions we were able to determine there was involvement with that party or that the country of origin was Krasnovia. 
Same thing with evidence of group E. We have a, a similar situation. And we also have some where we just label true or false, where we say these things, we're letting them occur in either no or all situations. So false for no, and true we say that always occurs. So th these are the two basic components, the environmental model and the analytical model. And the analyst will be responsible for entering in the environmental model, which will likely come from a, some sort of data source, and what the argument components map to, the conditions in which they could be true. So what the system will do is then it will generate all arguments for and against each group conducting the attack. So here is an argument saying group K is the culprit. Okay, if there's evidence of group K doing it, and then we have implication, if there's evidence, then group K is the culprit. However, oh, and these are the conditions in which those two statements are true, just from the last slide. However, we could have deception by group E. And if there's deception by group E, we had a logical statement saying that means that you don't have any evidence for K. And here's the conditions those are true. This argument, since it's saying once you have deception by the other group, your evidence for the first group is no longer good, we say that, we say the second argument undercuts the first one. However, notice in here that the conditions for the first argument there might be some overlap, but in general, uh, they're different. So what we look to do is we look to, dis we look to determine the condition where the first argument can be true. So the first argument, supposing that there's no deception, is true under these conditions. Group E conducting deception is true if group E is involved and the or country of origin is Krasnovia. So, Combining these together, we take the information from the first statement and we say, and we combine that with an and of the negation of the second, now gives us the precise scenario where the argument could be true, where we think that group K is the culprit. We then, using standard algorithms and the probabilistic environmental model I showed earlier, can compute a probability for this statement. And this is a very simple example. We only showed two arguments here. In reality, the system is going to generate all, uh, each culprit as well as all arguments that undercut those. And it will do this process I just showed here iteratively, and then it will determine the probabilities more accurately that way. So what we've done is we've established a mathematical framework. We've developed a theoretical basis for these algorithms, and we actually have a simple, a very simple type for, that works on dummy data. What we want to do next is we want to have our prototype working with real world data. And we want to start doing extensive tests using real world cyber data to see if this is getting uh, realistic attribution decisions. Now what we still have to figure out is can some of this input from the historical data? How robust will the system be if an adversary is aware we're using it? This is always a great uh, question I like to ask. And can the input data, the information about the current situation, be automatically gathered, say from log files and things like this, IDS reports? And also, how well will this be implemented on an extremely large scale where we're, get, where we're taking as a siphon information about an enterprise computer network. So finally, I'm going to close quickly with some ongoing work before going to questions. Uh, this is some work we have with George Mason and my student Damon. So of course, you're all familiar with this APT cycle of operations. And as we all know, cyber espionage is offense dominated. If the threat wants to get to your system and he has enough resources, he's going to get there. So why not just consider that the network is already compromised? And our idea is that if we create these distraction clusters, so clusters of virtual machines, and put them at certain places in the network, maybe we can delay the amount of time it takes from a hacker to get from a randomly compromised workstation to a target that we really want to defend, such as an intellectual property repository. So let's
And our idea is we put these distraction clusters where hopefully he goes off into them time there. Now, this, this, uh, such an idea would be predicated on being able to obtain network maps uh, going from system to system where we somehow determine what is the likelihood the attack will go from uh, compromised system A or intermediate system A to intermediate system B, for example. And are there vulnerabilities or are there protocols or software that are employed on those systems that are compromised? So our model of the adversary, we have defined an intrusion penetration network, uh, which, is, which we specify the type of information we think we need to get this to work. We say as an associated access level. And the idea is the adversary is walking through systems in order to get to a target and get a desired level of access on that target. So anyway, uh, some final thoughts. My plea to you is help, help us build this new science of cyber, because I think it's going to help all parties involved. So if, you can, if you're not already doing it, posting rich data is a great way to help. Also, reading papers. Uh, I know I work with uh, Andrew, in, uh, who's at Trailers, and he, he takes a lot of time to do this. And I think that's a good thing because it provides an additional insight of, of ways people in the academic community are looking to solve problems. And likewise, if you're reading an academic paper, let them know why their assumptions are wrong. It's one thing just to write them off, well, this guy's full of it. But it's better if you tell him where he's gone wrong, and maybe in the next iteration of it, he'll address those. And finally, I would ask, you know, just be open-minded. Some academic ideas might sound a little nutty at first. Probably some of these have. But uh, the software to transition, and you feel it has a little bit of potential, I ask to just be open to it. So uh, that's about all I got. Any questions? I want to actually, this is much more of a statement than a, um, than a question in that um, to the things that you mentioned just in your, in your last um, slide, if you are working on something and you, and you find an academic, you have in additional information on it that, they, that they're not aware of, contact that academic. There is, there is more interest, though it's, but there's more interest in cross-pollination. And there's a chance here to do collaborative work, to get, to get an, your research um, and your knowledge into it. Um, if they're wrong and you contact them, one world is that academics are used to taking a stand, doing as much as they can, publishing on it, Maybe someday later, somebody else tells them that they're wrong, and that's okay. Um, then you work together and you find something else. So um, let us know when we're when we're um, screwed. Uh, let us know when we're wrong. Um, with you and find something else. That's that's what science is. It's not religion. It's it's figuring. It's it's going with what you've got and then figuring out um, where we can get from there. Anyway, I'm sorry to, to monopolize. I just think this is great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, when we were modeling the uh, different actors, uh, how well or, or have the, uh, the models so far taken into account non-rational actors, people just doing something to see if they can? Or? So are you talking about the power grid or the attribution? Uh, the attribution. OK, so the, the good news is with the attribution problem is we're not we don't have an assumption of rationality in there. We have if-then logical rules that state if this, is, if this is true, then this other thing is true with a certain probability. And this comes straight from the historical data is what we envision. So we don't make any assumption of rationality. You could have guys as crazy as you like. Yes? Have I looked at what? No, we, ha we haven't started to look at any real-world data yet. We, we've just got past the point of the mathematical model and uh, um, 
implementing a system to show that the math works. Um, but yeah, we have, I have talked about YAR with some people, yes. Okay, well, thank you for that. So that, those are both good. So okay. Uh, so the question was: Is how if we have data for particularly the attribution work, how should it best be formatted, and where do the probabilities come from? Um, so this is what we want to explore. Uh, we want to we want to look at how to determine these probabilities. There are methods to learn probabilities for rules and statements like that. Um, with existing algorithms to create those rules. The other thing is probabilities for, you saw in the top part, I'll just go back to the slide. So, well, what happened there? All right, well, okay, good. Hey, it's the best laptop I could afford at Walmart. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So any anyway, model, the top part, information about the current situation, the probabilities there will likely, what I'm thinking at least, will come from the analyst because these are things I observed and so, a lot of times you'll say, okay, that's true with 100%. Sometimes is maybe like if it's something like coding style, you say, eh, it's kind of like this group, and maybe you could value than one. The bottom part, these rules, my vision is that would be extracted from historical data um, using existing algorithms. Talk offline about what you got and uh, you know what I think could be used to get it looking like this at some point. Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that's, that's the idea about this is, you know, I want to go, you know, there's, there's some existing work on attribution, but it typically focuses on one kind of analysis, whether it be, you know, static analysis or um, looking at PCAP files and so forth. And then there's very little work that looks at taking in, in, a, in a formal software system, external information like, you know, uh, motivations and in more squishy intelligence such as human intelligence. I want to have everything in one system. That's what, that's what we want to do with this. Yeah? When you're talking about uh, having us take a look at the academic sources, can you give me a couple of good places to look at the academic sources? Google Scholar. So, So, yeah. so I would, well, I could give you some, I could give you some initial, initial suggestions, though. Um, in, in the academic world, computer science is very much conference-oriented. Uh, one of the bigger conferences that includes a lot of security research is IEEE Infocom. Um, additionally, there's uh, some people that are very well known in the academic field for doing cyber research. Uh, one of them that springs to my mind is Sushil uh, Jajodia, uh, who is, uh, his name was in my slides from George Mason. Um, that might be a good starting point to look at. But also, if you go to most major universities are actually setting up uh, cybersecurity centers. If you go to their website, they'll list the faculty and their research interests, and that's actually a good place. And often the papers will be posted right on the website.
Okay, anything else? Yes? So the question is, on the inherent nature, inherent in unstable nature of the power grid, have we looked into OODA loops? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we, we haven't, you know, the OODA loop is more um, at, an operational, at an operational level. Uh, we're looking at this as a decision support tool to help processes like that. Um, so... Uh, so OODA is observe orient uh, uh, so this will really uh, tools like these will really help more in the orient step so we can get information about you know based on the knowledge we have about the threat actor how can we make a better decision uh, to reduce the effect of his potential attack any other yes Okay, so the question is, what am I using to generate the confidence percentages in this environmental model? So as far as compared to real world results? Okay, so that really depends on, um, you know, paper to paper. Um, you know, so for example, in, in uh, work on malware clustering, you, you know, when uh, there's work on, they compare the clustering of the malware to uh, existing malware families identified by some antivirus product. Um, uh, what I do is, you know, most of the time I have a, a, some real world data to compare it to and I'll do a statistical analysis to see how close I came. Uh, with the attribution stuff, our initial tests are again more to make sure that to confirm that the mathematics are right and moving forward uh, with real world data we will be do, we'll look to do things like statistical tests see how often it gets the right attribution decision and, and so forth. Anything else? Yes? So, um, we have not tested it with three players, but we've tested it with one attacker who could attack multiple substations. So I'm not sure what a third player would do other than in So um, So the idea is that uh, with our schedule is given a schedule over a certain time period you have a probability where you do your updates so based on probability distribution, there's maybe more important ones that you update more often, and there's lesser ones you update less often. And so um, with this in place, any attack by an attacker, we're reducing, on average, the number of systems that are down in the worst case. Okay? So, um, so I mean, that's, that's how we account for attackers who will be, will be time-phased. Was that, did that make sense or do you have a follow on? Well, yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that, um, and that's one of my uh, future directions with this, is how do you appropriately make a uh, schedule based on these probability distributions? And there have been other domains where they've been able to do this. Uh, they've applied game, th game theory has been applied to uh, Coast Guard patrols scheduling of uh, TSA security personnel on planes and so forth. And they, they also deal with this assumption, that they also deal with this issue that in real life, you know, there isn't set time windows when the attacker is attacking. Uh, we just haven't explored that line of literature as to how they went from the probabilistic schedule uh, software produces to the real world. But that's, that's something we're starting with. Anything else? Yes.
Well, my, my hope is that we can have aut things automatically ingested based on existing analysis. So things like um, you know IOC files and and you know the uh, uh, Cybox standards that were mentioned in the last talk, and even st even more low level stuff like PCAPs. Uh, we, I would like to see these directly ingested into the system and then these rules get automatically generated. We're not there yet, um, but we want to first make sure that we have the right framework for reasoning about things. So in our initial iterations, probably most of the stuff will be um, coming from a single source. Okay, well, I think that's it. <laughs>